And uh, I was very excited uh, to know that I was going to meet you and meet uh, people that are aspiring to be jewelry designers because it's very interesting that for the past two years, uh, there has been like a lot of people wanting to go into design. And this is amazing. It shows that people aren't shy anymore to follow their passion and even even if just studying jewelry design without opening your own brand is still as amazing as having your own company. If not, you can always be a designer for other companies or other entities. So kudos to you guys. Uh, all right, so usually this course is, it takes me about three days uh, to give, but today I'm gonna try to minimize it as much as I can. Um, I can stay over an hour. So if you guys need to like ask me anything, I'm right here. So we're gonna start. First of all, what is jewelry design? So jewelry design is taking an, an idea or something that is important to you and implementing it into something that can be worn by you or, or your loved ones or so many people. You have to keep in mind that in jewelry design, it's not just about the beauty of the piece, it's the feasibility of the piece. Is the uh, it Consider the market. It's not like if you love, let's say, rainbows, you want to create a whole collection of rainbows. Is it feasible? Are people going to wear it? Are people going to pay for something that costs one, two thousand dollars that is full of diamonds for a rainbow, let's say a rainbow motif. So you have to consider that not everything you love, you can make. So this is the first thing to consider. We have to be reasonable. We have to be rational. So and also what you need to consider if you're looking to make money, uh, do you want to create to sell or do you want to create to create a name? Uh, so. This is something else that you have to also consider. So first you have to talk about the sources of inspiration. How can you be inspired? You can be inspired by either flora or fauna. So flora is anything floral. Like let's say you like nature, you like trees, you like flowers. So this is, so for example, me, this is what I love. I'm always, always going towards nature, natural colors, um, Everything, everything na nature inspires me. Maybe other brands like, for example, Cartier, what inspires them is flora and fauna, fauna, which is animals, like the leopard, the tiger, the snake for Bulgari. Do you guys get what I'm, what I'm trying to explain? Please let me know if I'm clear. Yes, yes, yes. I'm trying to go so fast because I, I have so much information I want to give you. But if by any means you have any questions, please let me know, okay? All right. So for flora, as I said, you have flowers, trees, vegetation. Sometimes there are designers that take the actual leaves and they it's like they, they put it under the transparent paper and they actually trace it. Or for example, they put it in a mold where you can get the exact texture of the leaf or the flower. So you can also do that as well. As I told you, you have Cartier, Van Cleef, they love flora. You have uh, also, uh, if you look at the old Van Cleef, the Art Deco, it was all flora. There was no fauna back in the day. A fauna is like, a, fauna, as I said, is animals, anything animals. This is like new, like this is the new kind of generation that are using leopards, elephants, etc. All right. So first we have to talk about the historical sources. So jewelry design went through eras. So in every era you had a different type of jewelry. If you go back to your grandma's jewelry, don't you notice like the jewelry back then was very geometric or very, uh, or even the diamonds were not even cut the way they're cut now. So every era has its own style. We can go back to the Victorian era and the Art Deco era, which was from 1920 to 1940. And then you have the Egyptian era where they were so much into gold, less diamonds, more into jewels. Then you have the Roman era where also they were 
inspired with the Colosseum. They were inspired by statues. So even if you remember those gemstones that had the carving on them, this was back also to the Victorian era. So you can tell a lot about jewelry just by looking at it of which era it came from. And also India has the most amazing jewelry uh, where they used to not cut their diamonds. They used to cut them, used to leave them as they are, if you know what I'm talking about. I think maybe you're going to get to that in your course. All right. Uh, and then you have symbolic sources. Other than flora and fauna, let's say, what's the biggest symbolic, uh, symbolic jewelry that we know of? Like Cartier, the love bracelet. So the love bracelet had a huge impact uh, in, uh, like with, with our demographic because Everybody loves love and they worked on this marketing scheme. And now the love bracelet is the most sought after piece of jewelry because of the idea of love. It's going to give you love. It's going to grant you love. It's just like a positive feeling. You have other uh, items you can uh, think about, other symbolic sources like uh, star signs, horoscopes. Uh, if you look at, I think, um, I think it's Van Cleef, uh, who are now, they launched their horoscope, uh, horoscope collection, if I'm not mistaken. So this also goes back in and out. Some people like it, some people don't. You have also cultural affiliations like goddesses, gods, um, that, that a lot of brands are focusing on. And you have the yin yang, like the black and white, the, um, how to say, anything religious to you, like Arabs and especially Muslims, they love the Allah and the evil eye. Do you know what I mean? Do you, what do you guys uh, prefer? What kind of symbolic uh, uh, jewelry do you see in India? Jewelry? Chokers, you guys, you're into chokers, yeah? Mm -hmm. Yes, and I think the rest of the world stole that idea from you, and especially in very nice occasions, you guys wear the most beautiful chokers. Yes, that's it. So you can, for example, let's say you want to create your own new brand. You can create modern chokers, or you can play on that scheme. If this is something that interests you, you know? Or maybe you can do... Cho modern chokers with the horoscope uh, motif. So every designer has their own touch and every designer has their own thing that they love to create. Hey, me. Sorry, is somebody talking to me? I can't hear you well. Um. Is somebody asking anything? No? Okay, all right. Okay, then you have like, um, you have, you have another type of inspiration, which is man-made, man-made sources. You have, for example, statues, like for example, Eiffel Tower, a lot of jewelry is um, made after the, those geometric lines of the Eiffel Tower. Uh, as I said, also in Italy, like uh, the Romans used the monuments to fashion their jewelry. And then you have the Seven Wonders. Uh, and then you have like in India, the Taj Mahal, a lot of jewelry also came from that type of like sketches that were in the Taj Mahal. So you have a lot to work with. Okay, I wanna skip through those because they're a lot and I want to save time. I wanna to talk to you about supplies. So for supplies, did they explain to you in, uh, in your course? Of course they explained to you. So you guys know the supplies. Do you want me to skip that step? Yeah? Okay. Uh, All right. Then... Okay. So, so everything you're learning in class is, is, is very, very important. Like you need the vellum and the black paper and you need the tape and the need, the need, to, because when you sketch, you have to need the, the graphite, you know, so it doesn't smudge. I think we can do this maybe later. If I do another session for you guys, like we can do a small, um, a class about jewelry design. So I'll skip through that as well. Okay, I want to skip my slides and I wanna to talk to you as a friend. I know it's so scary to enter the jewelry design business and it's so scary because first of all, it's not cheap. Uh, you need a lot of capital to go through this. And second of all, we all feel that sometimes we, we reach a dead wall where we don't know what we're doing. We don't know how to come up with an idea. We don't know how to 
articulate our thoughts sometimes. This happens to me all the time where I sometimes I can't articulate my thoughts and I go through like a period of blockage for two, three months. And sometimes the silliest thing can trigger your emotions and out of emotions comes the making of jewelry. You can't make your jewelry or create a piece of jewelry if you don't have passion for it. If you don't have a passion, a story behind your piece. So let's say, for example, um, let's say you love gemstones. So you say, okay, I'm gonna create a collection with gemstones, just a simple collection with gemstones. But how are you gonna come up with that design around, around the gemstones, let's say? You, don't, you, want to, you want to classify yourself in a different level than the rest of the jewelry designers, let's say. Don't pressure yourself because no two people have the same style. Even if you and your friend created the same ruby ring, each one of you is gonna have their own style, their own size. Maybe, maybe your friend likes to make things small. Maybe you like to make things large. Maybe you want to um, venture and try something like um, crazy, like something that's unusual, untraditional. It is okay to, to experiment when you first start, but keep in mind that not everything you sketch size-wise is the same thing you're going to come up with. I want to help. I want to explain to you how to come up with a motive. But the thing is, if I want to do that, I need to show you actual sketches. But I'm going to explain to you a little bit. I think they're also explained to you there. Where let's say you have a paisley, a paisley motive. I'm going to show you something. So let's say you have a paisley. Okay, this is a very horrible paisley. I don't know if you can see it. Okay, so from this motive, this is of course very large. What they taught us is let's say you can Xerox this to let's say 1% or 2% where you can make it very small and you can put vellum on top of this. And from this motive, that is, it can be a squiggly line. It can be something like this, let's say doesn't have to be a paisley, whatever. And you can take your vellum and when you put your vellum on top of this, you can just take half of this motive, quarter of this motive and play around to create like a circle or an earring or whatever comes up. You have to practice doing that a lot to come up with the shape that you want. Um, did they explain this to you? Because I don't know which class you guys are at what level. Did you guys go through the motive steps? Yes, ma'am. We, we had a session on this. Okay, so you know what I'm talking about because I, I sound gibberish, yeah? You understand what I mean? Yes. Okay, yes. So once you come up with your motive, if you want to create your own line, let's say this is the motive that you want to create your classic line from. You might not want to create a line from this. You can do just a piece that is unique. There is no right and wrong when creating your jewelry line or becoming a jewelry designer. Sometimes I have a line that has 40 pieces of different colors and the same thing. And sometimes I have a line that's two pieces, an earring and a ring. So don't let other designers or when you look at other designers um, make you feel pressured that you have to follow rules. You don't have to follow any rules. You, you can do your own thing and you will only be known and you will only make a mark when you do your own thing. People first are gonna judge you. Like, what is she doing? What is this? What are these designs? Who are gonna wear these designs? But then when you come up with your, your print, then people will know, okay, oh, these are this girl's design or this guy's design. Why are you guys laughing? <laughs> Explain to me. Do you guys want to share anything with me? No, no, I'm fine. You're fine, you're good? Yeah, yeah. Ask me, I want to know what you guys want to know because I mean, this topic is very broad. I'm telling you, I give this course in a three day period. So what are you guys, at, what, what do you guys want to know about? <laughs> Ma'am? Yes. Uh, we just want to know how to generate ideas. From where can we start? That's what we were talking about. So to generate ideas, you have to look at your surroundings. 
you have, as I said, the flora, which is everything in nature. You can be inspired by flowers, by trees, by, uh, I don't know, the pavement squares, any, anything that is out in nature. Then you have the fauna. Fauna is, as I said, anything animal related, anything living related. Humans might inspire you. The figure of a woman might inspire you. So you have that flora and fauna, as I said. And then you go to the other things like historic sources, like I, I previously said, where you have the Victorian era, the Art Deco era, you can go back through uh, historic uh, jewelry and maybe get inspired from that. Maybe you can go back to the old jewelry of India and get inspired and create something that is new and funky, but with the inspiration in your mind. You also, as I said, have symbolic sources, which are religion, love, star signs, yin yang, and cultural affiliations. You also have the man-made sources, which are building gates, structures, monuments, the seven wonders, uh, objects of daily use. I had a friend, she uh, created her own line and uh, it was all made out of uh, sewing kit items. So the, the needle and the thread, like she'd have like the, the pin or the needle with the thread as a, as a earring. And um, I don't know if you know what I'm talking about. We use something where we put it on our finger so it doesn't hurt us when we're sewing. It's like a hat with the holes. So she also, she used that to make rings and to make earrings. So this was something from a household item that created an impact. Um, you have also, as I said, mythological sources where if you're into Greek mythology or Indian Buddhist mythology, so sometimes your jewelry can be Buddh Buddhism inspired or Islamic inspired, or uh, you can go through more uh, religious uh, things like uh, the cross, like, I mean, the cross, what is the cross? The cross is a religious symbol. So this is like relig like jewelry that was based on the crucifixion. So this is an example. Anything else you would like to ask me? So anything, anything around you, your child might inspire you. Um, the other day I was sitting with my kids and I told them like, just sketch something, show me what you come up with. And honestly, they come up with ideas like innocent children can give you really bright and colorful things that you might take and play on. Uh, I have a question now. Yes. Uh, you, you, when, you began, when you started with the presentation, you said that it's very scary to get into this industry as many of them are into this industry. Right? So when coming into this industry, everybody wants to do something unique. Some, some, they want to come up with something unique idea like that. Like, yeah. and, and uh, if you look into Indian population, it's a huge a lot. And there are so many of them pursuing for this course, right? This uh, journey designing course. And everybody wants to do something new and unique. So when we think about the idea about being unique, what kind of market strategy should we have in our mind to target uh, consumers? That's the thing. So who do you want to target? Do you want to target teenagers or do you want to target men or do you want to target 40 to 60 year olds where you want to go into the very high end jewelry because mind you not a 20 year old can't afford what a 40 year old let's say like you have to keep you understand what i mean like our mom's and our grandma's jewelry is not like our jewelry we're not there yet so you have to keep in mind what what's the demographic you're trying to reach so when you have that in mind, and also what are your values? So each and every one of you can like sit one day, like in your free time and think about your values. For example, I'm sorry, I, I didn't get your name. What's your name? My name is Shudia All right, nice to meet you. So as you were saying, let's say you're, val let's say you're a feminist. So your pieces are always gonna reflect your feminism. They might be wild, they might be out there, they might be uh, extreme, they might not be like simple. You know what I mean? I have another friend who's also a designer. She's very simple. She does the most beautiful items, small like trinkets that show the femininity of a woman. She's extremely feminine. So 
what you are, it will come out in your jewelry, but you need to write it down. What do you value? Like, what is it that you value? Do you value religion? You're gonna find your pieces being very affiliate, affiliated with religion. If you value like, for example, when I started, all I wanted to work with was gemstones. Gemstones was a very, very important thing for me. And if you look at my designs when I first started, it was all based on like simple gemstones with diamonds. I, ha I didn't have major designs. And then slowly I started to build my line. I started to understand another value I didn't know I had was that I loved birds. I loved birds. I loved the idea of freedom. And that came out in a very big collection of mine that is now my classic collection. So freedom for me is a big value. Your value might be family. So it might be like, like for example, you know that forever, the eight, the, the infinity uh, forever <laughs> sign. Okay, what, what is this, what, what was this behind? It's infinity love, right? So this is what, what this Tiffany, when they came up with this, it was about love, forever love. So it's what you value. What is important to you? Some, a lot of jewelers do jewelry about their mother. Like I love my mom and I love mom, mom. This is what they value. You might not value that. I might not value that. So their value is family. So according to your value, your designs will turn into that. But I, to, I did the hard way. So I never sat down and wrote my values. When I started my collections, there are so many collections that I did that were horrible. Like, I don't know why I did them. You're gonna make mistakes. It's normal. You can't do everything perfectly. But then when I sat down once and I decided, you know what? I need to think about my values. I need to think what I want to. Your jewelry is a story. What type of story do you want to tell the world? What is your story? Do you want to, who do you, who, who's your demographic? You, you want to sell expensive jewelry or cheap jewelry? Do you want to be able to sell to everybody or to an exclusive type of people? Well, I have uh, another question. Uh, yes. Like uh, there are semi-precious stones and precious stones, right? Yes. Yeah, different, uh, different kinds of stones, right? So uh, uh, do you think designing your jewelry if you said the precious jewelry could compete with precious stones? Yes, of course. Why not? I do with I, I use semi-precious stones and precious stones. This has nothing to do with anything. You can even mix them in one piece. Let's say you want to create a piece of choker with gemstones. You can use um, I don't know, emeralds and corals. You are free. There is no limit to your creativity. Nobody, you should not listen or not abide by anyone's thoughts of what jewelry that you can and you can't do. Because if you do, you won't get anywhere because you're taking other people's approval or is this nice or isn't this nice? You're the one who should decide, do I want to create this or not? Is this feasible? Is this okay? Is this good looking? Um, will anyone buy this? Mind you not so many jewelers create pieces that nobody buys but that's okay, it sets them in the market. There are so many jewelry pieces that were done by the biggest houses of jewelry that nobody purchases. Maybe now they purchase them because they've been on the market for a hundred years, but back then who's gonna buy, let's say, um, I don't wanna say anything because like, I don't wanna market anyone, but anyway, you understand what I mean. You do you. When you build a brand name, Anything you do is going to make sense. But you have to put your foot in the market. Like, this is my design. These are my designs. This is who I am. This is the story I'm trying to communicate. You like it, you like it, you don't. Well, it's okay. Not everybody's going to like you at the end. Not everybody's going to like your work. Not everyone's going to appreciate what you're doing. And that's okay. And sometimes it's scary to start. Like, when I started, I honestly started with nothing. Like, I was like, okay, I'm gonna do this and I'm gonna start my line, but financially I was not able to launch the way I wanted to launch or to do as many pieces that I was able to do. At the beginning, I was only able to do like 10 items, 
10 pieces of jewelry and that was okay. It's okay to start small. There's no shame in that. So don't say, oh, I don't have a lot of money. I can't start my line now. No, that's not right. You can start with two, three pieces. Sorry? Excuse me, ma'am. Yes. Yes, ma'am. I really like the ring in your hand. Could you just explain us about that? The blue one. Ah, uh, the blue one? This is just a, a ring that's actually, I didn't do it. I purchased it, but it's just a blue enamel with a solitaire. Well, that's really nice. Yeah. You can also work with enamel. Enamel is something that some designers are taking into consideration. When I first started my jewelry line, I did not want to work with enamel. And then three years in, I was like, you know, I'm going to do a collection. I'll experiment with that. And it was fun. Is it something that I absolutely love? No. Sorry. I'm sorry, are you saying something? I can't hear you. Yes, do you guys want to ask me anything? No, ma'am. What else do you want me to talk about? Is there anything else? Because I can go through details, but you guys were asking me of how to come up with a motive, how to come up with the idea. Actually, I wanted to know, like, uh, there's a country uh, called Bilad, right? Bilad. Okay. Bilad. Bilad. So, uh, uh, so all the designers, all the, like, the jewelry market and the fashion market is more over there. So what brings Bilad into that category? Okay, Milan is a, is a fashion, fashion house. Not yeah. so much in jewelry. It's Italian jewelry, it's unreal. But if you want to specify Milan, Milan is more, more with the fashion industry. If you're talking about fashion jewelry, that's something else. But if you're talking about high-end jewelry, um, Milan is not the base of high-end jewelry. But um, first of all, Italian jewelry, you can never compare to any jewelry in the world. Their craftsmanship, their, their quality, they're, they're finishing it. It's amazing. Like no, no designer was able to reach that outside of Italy. It's just, it's like, it's like if you're saying Italians and leather, you know, every country has its like India and diamonds. Nobody can compete with India and diamonds, you know? So why, like, why do you think that nobody in the world can compete with Indian diamonds? Like what's your opinion on that? I'll tell you why. Because Indians, first of all, you have so many generations of cutters from India. You're not just saying that they started cutting in the last 10 years. They've been cutting diamonds for hundreds of years or ever since they started cutting diamonds. And you have it like from the grandfather and the father, the father of the grandfather and the grandchild and so on. And it's going to go on for generations. So this creates... Um, like supreme craftsmanship. Like I can't, I trust buying my diamonds from India, let's say, more than anywhere else in the world. And especially with small diamonds. Uh, big diamonds, you have other countries that spe specify in that. But small diamonds, there's no one like the Indian cutters for small diamonds. And for me, I love also Indian craftsmen. I worked with many craftsmen. I worked with Arab craftsmen. I worked with the Italian craftsmen. But I always, always uh, love the work of Indian craftsmen. Because also, they, they understand what they're doing. So you have to be proud. You come yes. from the source of jewelry. <laughs> yes. <laughs> the other question I wanted to ask you is that like uh, in jewelry field, there are so many other careers also, yeah, gemologist, being a diamond graduate. So how, why did you choose to become a jewelry designer? Actually, I the last thing I, I decided to become was a jewelry designer. I first, it was not the first thing that I wanted to do. I had finished my university and then I did my MBA and I wanted to go into pure business. And then, but I always had a, like a love for jewelry. 
I just loved how it looked. It's not like that I wanted to wear it and I wanted to be all blingy. No, no, it's just, I love the, the intricacy of it. So, and then I decided to venture into learning about stones. I love stones as well. I love diamonds. Uh, I wanted to learn. I want to learn what is, what is a diamond? What differentiates a good diamond from a bad diamond? It's very important if you guys have not taken a course in, a simple course in diamonds or gemstones, I really urge you because as designers, when you're going to work with craftsmen or company, you first of all, you're going to buy don't you want to buy your diamonds one day? You want to know what you're buying. You want to know, uh, are they cheating you? Are they taking more money than you? Are you buying something that might be super cheap and not reasonable? Maybe this is not really diamonds, etc. So you need to understand what you're buying, unless you're going to work just with gold. A lot of designers just choose to work with gold and that's fine. But if you're planning on creating jewelry that contains uh, diamonds and gemstones, I really urge you to take at least some simple courses that at least you know what you're working with. Um, this is very, very important. And then, uh, so anyways, after I, I studied uh, about diamonds and gemstones, and then I decided I wanted to go through design. I wanted to understand design. I wanted to know how things are made. You don't have to become a jewelry designer to open your gold or diamond brand. Uh, you can simply go to a craftsman and tell them, you know what, I want something simple. I want something, I don't know what. A craftsman can help you. But when you want to become a designer, it means you want to put your fingerprint in the item. So that's how it started. And then I started teaching it because I love it so much. And things happen. I don't know, things unfolded. I mean, you might find yourself in two years teaching jewelry design. You love it so much. You might not like the industry. The industry is not easy at all. This is not something that anyone teaches you. You need to be fast, you need to be smart, and you need to be quick. Because the moment they know like you're, you're new on the market or you don't know what you're doing or you don't, you've never bought diamonds before, directly they will mark up their price. It's just the way it is. It's business is business. It's not personal. So you might not like that. It's a very stressful and competitive um, field, but... You can also think of it another way where you don't want to compete. Like for me, I don't want to compete. I do it for, for the love of what I do, not for the competition. <laughs> Sorry, I can't hear you. And there's one screen that went black. Hello? Excuse me, ma'am. Ma'am, I just wanted to know what are the challenges that you have faced throughout the process from establishing yourself in the market? Oh, a lot, a lot. You mean in what, in what area? You mean with the... In everything right from the starting, from the designing aspect to launching your own brand. Okay, so the name for when, yourself. I, when I started, I had so many... First of all, I had a few doors like shut in my face, like who are you? We're not going to work with you. You're brand new. You know, like, like people won't, don't take you seriously till you actually put your foot in there. You know, um, I had, I've been rejected so many times by a few, like few factories that create jewelry. Uh, a lot of them would tell me, what is this? Um, this is not something we can create. This is not feasible, or this is not uh, wearable. I was like, this is, these are my designs. This is what I want to do. Like, I didn't ask your opinion. I just want to may have this made. You're going to get paid and I'm going to get what I want. And they wouldn't accept. Um, another challenge that I had, honestly, and this is something that I urge you, I urge you to be careful from, is that I created a whole collection. And when I went to my factory to do it, um, I did not know that it has been done before. And it was solely my idea. And after I have created those pieces, I found out that somebody else has created something super similar. So I had paid a lot of money. Uh, this would taint my reputation. Um, you can't go back because mind you not, when you create a piece, you're not just paying for the gold and the diamonds, you're creating for the craftsmanship. And craftsmanship costs as much can be as much as the gold. So I could not go back and 
I was not warned. So this is a very big lesson that I, I, I learned in my life. And now every time I create a piece, I triple, double, quadruple check that it has not been done on the market. So this is something really to, to really, really think about because sometimes you think that this is your idea and this is my idea and this is new, but, but sometimes we both get the same ideas at the same time. It's like nobody stole from anybody. It happens. You might re write a book that somebody else wrote the same exact story or same exact book. I mean, we're okay to have the same the process and ideas. Sorry, no. I said it is okay to have the same thought process and ideas. Yes. So even if somebody else has done it in the market, how do they tamper your image? It will tamper your image when you're in the same market. It will, it will, it will taint you. But because I'm honest, because I know I created my piece solely, I knew what I was doing. That's where I, I didn't feel guilty. But it's very sad as well. You have to also keep in mind that people are going to copy you. So I had also other designers copy my work and that's fine. But it's, it's sad because you put all that effort and hard work and then somebody just comes and steals your idea. So you also have to keep in mind that this should not affect you. When you go into this field, you should not compare yourself to anyone. You should not compete with anyone. It will get you nowhere. You do you and everything else will follow. I mean, I'm telling you, as I said in the beginning, let's say I want to create a tanzanite ring and you create a tanzanite ring. And let's say they give us the same exact specifications. You're gonna use 12, uh, two mm stones and three, five, and uh, they give us the same ingredients. Each one of us is gonna come up with a completely different thing. And that's perfectly okay because everybody has their own footprint or fingerprint. Excuse me, ma'am. Yes. Earlier when you started, were your designs being rejected from the designing point of view or there were other reasons? Everything like, first of all, when I started, I mean, in India, they love gemstones, right? You guys understand gemstones. All your jewelry contains gemstones. But in the Middle East, I mean, wherever you go, mostly, I'm not saying everyone. I mean, I am in UAE, Dubai, where it's very diversified. I'm not talking about Dubai or UAE. I'm talking about like other Arab countries or the rest of the Middle East. They only work with three gemstones. They work with emeralds, rubies, and sapphires because these are the precious ones, the ones they love, the ones they know. If you introduce any other gemstone to them, it's not valuable. They don't know what it is. Even if you bring a paraiba tourmaline or a pat paracha or any valuable stone, they're just going to, I mean, you, you know paraiba tourmaline because you are from the source. But if I say paraiba to any other Arab that does not know about gemstones, you're not going to know how valuable the stone is. So I might create such a beautiful and valuable ring that costs thousands of dollars and nobody would buy it from me. And this is what I faced. So in the beginning, the first collection I made, I, cre I used various gemstones, precious and semi-precious. And they, nobody would understand them. I mean, one of my friends told me, is this lemon quartz a yellow diamond? So can you imagine? So nobody would understand. So that was fine, but it took time, but then I don't know, I think gemstones started booming last year and a lot of designers started using gemstones and people are now more aware that gemstones are valuable. So this is a very big thing that I faced when I started uh, my line. Is there anything else anyone wants to Can you tell about jewelry market in Dubai? It's amazing. It's amazing. Uh, jewelry preferred? Sorry? Which jewelry do they prefer? Which jewelry do they prefer? Mm -hmm. So you have, for example, the locals uh, prefer the gold jewelry, similar to the Indian jewelry, like the large necklaces, the chokers, especially for wedding occasions. They're beautiful. Like they have these large sets. 
um, you have the, for example, the Russian market here, because Dubai is so diversified and it has many markets and many cultures. So the Russian, um, the Russian cultures, they love the large gemstones, they love large jewelry. You have the rest of the Europeans who like small jewelry. Um, Arabs are very into diamonds. It's just diamonds and as i told you like uh, ruby emerald sapphire they will only purchase like one piece one piece of ruby one piece of emerald that's it uh but so much into diamonds um our generation love the the plain gold like for example stackable things stackable necklaces chains are so in right now italian chains are like the thing to have where you can buy just plain plain chains and just stack them on top of each other uh, gold hoops. So I guess like because UAE is very diversified, anyone from any country coming to bring in their jewelry, they will find a market for it. And what about branded uh, jewelries? Yes, of course. Who doesn't love branded jewelries? But you know, as, as much as I would like to say that it's just gold, you know, like like any, any high-end jewelry is just gold, but Again, you have the high craftsmanship and the value of the piece. Like when you're buying a Bulgari ring or a Cartier ring, you're not just buying the gold, you're buying Cartier, you're buying Bulgari. It's not just the gold. I mean, you can simply go bring a, uh, do a plain love bangle, like a plain bangle that looks like the love bracelet, but you're not buying Cartier. So branded jewelry sell you the name. They don't sell you the piece of jewelry. Uh, I have a question. Yes. Uh, do you think NFTs will affect the jewelry design market? The NFTs. what? Sorry, I didn't hear you. NFTs. NFTs. Are there fees? NFTs. Uh, I, I'm sorry, can you stop? I, I, I can't hear you well because it's not really clear. Can you type it for me? Uh, you can type in chat box. Okay. Uh, non fungible tokens. Non fungible tokens. Non fungible. Non-tangible fees. Yeah. Non okay. So, what was your question again? Yeah. So, do you think uh, that would affect uh, the jewelry market in current times? What do you mean? Like, what do you mean non-tangible fees? I understand what non-tangible fees are, but what do you mean? How can they affect the the jewelry market? Uh, the designs. Uh, mm -hmm. You mean the designer's market? Yeah. So as a designer, the non-tangible fees, how would they affect me as a designer? Can you rephrase your question? Uh, okay. Type it. Uh, Ma'am? Yes. Which area to focus on designing or branding? Oh. This is a very important question. <laughs> you can't, you can't separate both. Your design is going to be your asset. Okay, so your design is your asset, whether you brand or you don't brand. But your branding is so important if you want to be known now. Like, I want to be known within two, three years. You have to market, you have to brand. But for me, I was not so interested in branding. I was in interested in creating an image for myself without branding through my work. It's going to be very confusing for you. But you guys are talking a lot, so I can't, uh, I can't focus. <laughs> Sorry. So... You spoke, your, your friend asked, what do you focus on? Branding or you focus on your jewelry? So I say 100% focus on your jewelry. Focus on your jewelry because your jewelry will brand itself. Sometimes you have horrible jewelry that is branded to the extreme and is so famous and everybody buys it and it's absolutely ridiculous. 
in my opinion, I, I mean, everybody has their taste because they branded it in a way where it was like very, very aggressive and it just penetrated the market. But sometimes there are so many beautiful brands and I learned this from the Italian jewelers. I met many, many Italian jewelers that were not known and, and if you open their Instagram page, they have 5,000 followers and they've been on the market for 20 years, let's say. But their jewelry speaks for itself. You don't, their quality, their class, their valuability. So I believe jewelry brands itself. And that also goes back to the question, do you want to be known now or do you want to be known in 10 years? So for me personally, I did not work on my branding so much. And I get so many comments from people like, why don't you brand yourself more? Why don't you market yourself more? I don't want to, of course I have to, because this is social media, but my work will speak for itself. And don't forget word of mouth is very important, very important. So put all your money and your effort on your pieces of jewelry. This is what I advise you, of course, Everybody has their own opinion. Amara, I just uh, want to ask you one uh, simple question. Yes. Which, which of your collection is very close to your heart? Oh, all of them. But yeah, I did so many mistakes where they're not very much close to my heart. But I have my, uh, the one very, very close to my heart is the free macaw. Because it's the feathers of a parrot and it, uh, it's freedom. And I am all for freedom. Okay. Freedom for me is a very big value. Thank you. Where we can see that pictures? Uh, uh, you can see them on my Instagram page. My website's under construction at the moment. Hopefully it will be launching in like maximum two weeks. Uh, I made it more, um, when I started and I created my website, it was very, um, very like, a lot of text, it was talking more about uh, stones. It was for not for the everyday user, but now I created it into a more shop type of website. And I advise you all to do that. Don't go for intricate websites because nobody cares. <laughs> like I'm saying it honestly, I made this mistake. Just go for the shop, shopping, easy. Drop, cart. <laughs> Thank you. I'm sorry, she asked the question, how do you think non, non-fungible or do you mean non-tangible? Tokens with effective jewelry yes. design markets. I'm sorry, I'm not familiar with non-fungible tokens. Don't know. Do you mean the cryptocurrency? Uh, no, there's a like, uh, new uh, thing. Uh, like you, you design your own uh, designs okay. on it and then you sell it to that. Yes, you can do that. Of course, this is what I first told you that when you're studying jewelry design, you don't need to open your own line. You can become a freelance designer. So it does not affect the jewelry design markets. If you see big houses, like um, I always refer back and forth to Van Cleef and Bulgari because you can learn a lot from them. And I really do urge you to uh, pick up uh, the biographies of Cartier and Bulgari and just to see their journey because not everyone, it was not easy for anyone to get to where they are. So speaking of that, they hire uh, jewelry designers to, I mean, let's say you, inshallah, you become very big one day. So you can hire a designer to create one line for you and another designer to create another line for you, even if you're a designer yourself. Look, in, in, uh, it's so nice to, to ask for help. It's so nice to collaborate. We often think that selfishness and me, it's just me, I want to shine, I want... No, sometimes collaborations create the most beautiful things and beautiful pieces. And you can pay a designer freelance to create that for you. I don't know, when I was taking classes, I had so many of my colleagues that come from long line of uh, jewelry names like uh, for example his dad or her dad would have their own jewelry line and probably some of you are also like this maybe you enter this class and you did not like jewelry design it's fine at least you can you have ideas you can hire a jewelry designer to actually sketch your thoughts or cad or what whatever you're comfortable with 
I see a lot of uh, jewelry designers putting up this NFTs, selling this in the market. Like I've recently seen about this, so I thought maybe that would take over some some kind of jewelry market. No, it won't. It won't. Everybody will get their share. I always believe this. Everybody will get their share, and even you as a designer, if you don't want to open your own place or own shop or own company. If your designs shine, you will be known for your name, and you should work on your name, not only the name of your company. It's how hard you want to work. It's how hard you want to study. Where do you want to get to? If you want to go far, you need to work hard. You need to study a lot. You need to, um, you need to. Sorry, like take a lot of. I don't, I don't want to say this. I can't say a bad word. <laughs> A lot of people, <laughs> it's just the way it is, it is, it is the way it is. Do you guys want to ask me anything else? Usually my jewelry design course is different from this. It's more structured and with a PowerPoint, but today I wanted it to be very casual. I wanted like you guys to ask me anything you guys are worried about. Just don't be afraid. What don't difference, uh, Tamara? What difference you find, find, found out, uh, like the students from India and students from uh, any other part of the world? They're all the same. Everybody who loves art and who loves creativity and who is creative, this is what's so beautiful about creativity. There is no language. There is no barrier. I mean, if if I mean. When you look at a piece of art or a piece of jewelry, do you know where this is coming from? From which country? Like, do you know who designed this? No, because it's a universal language. And this is why I love it so much. And it makes me so happy to see a lot of people who are coming into design from different parts of the world. And I would love to collaborate from any of you in the future. <laughs> so uh, we'll be more glad if you're coming to India and teaching us students as well. I hope, I wish, I want to come to India one day. Inshallah, inshallah, after Corona. <laughs> do you guys want to ask anything else or do you want me to? You can tell about Islamic jewelry. Islamic jewelry? Yeah. Islamic jewelry is very beautiful. Uh, I'm not very into it because there is a lot on the market, but Islamic jewelry, you have like um, Quran passages, uh, they use the name of Allah, Muhammad, a lot. Uh, I think the evil eye, I don't want to say it's Islamic, but maybe it goes back to the Turks, like Turkish started this evil eye kind of uh, motif. Um, that's basically Islamic jewelry. It's not really broad. I mean, it's only based on the, the God's names and like the prophets. <laughs> Christian jewelry, Christian jewelry, you don't have also a lot. You have the cross, you have Mary. Mm, I think that's about it, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, to which age group do you uh, specify what your designs? Sorry, can you repeat that? Because you work with uh, the designs you make. Yeah. Which, the, which, which age group do you prefer to make on? Oh, which age group? Uh, I prefer over 30. Because I, I just like to, I, my demographic is, let's say, 30 and above. Because I work with high-end pieces, because I, I don't do the cheap, like, I don't mean cheap as in not quality, I mean the, the, the cheap monetary-wise. So my jewelry is not very uh, everyday, accessible kind of jewelry. It's more of the high-end jewelry, which is fine, because this is the market I want to target because this is the type of jewelry I love to wear. And also remember, somebody might come and tell you, uh, you can't satisfy everybody, which is true. You can't satisfy everybody and you can't create jewelry that you love. And this is a very big mistake. I'm sorry, like a lot of people say it, a lot of jewelers say it, a lot of business um, people say it, or, or let's say craftsmen, but for me to, to create a footprint or a fingerprint in this industry, I have to do things that I absolutely love. 
even if you don't love it, even if they don't sell, even if they stay in my display for three years, but with proper quality, with proper uh, display, uh, if you do a piece that really speaks a story, if it doesn't sell today, it's gonna make your image tomorrow. It's gonna create your image. Let's say one of you creates a whole line of elephants. I mean, it's, it's not absurd. It's, it's very wild to do that. But in five years, I, I know, let's say your name is Sarah. So I'd know, oh, Sarah's jewelry is elephants. Oh, I see an elephant, somebody wearing like an elephant trinket. Oh, this is probably X's jewelry. So don't, don't listen to anyone, please. Do you, you do you. <laughs> How do you think you can make mark on this industry? Like, Sorry? Uh, like put a mark on this industry. How do you create a mark? Yeah. With, with, your, with your creativity with your passion. I was rejected once by this huge factory. They were amazing. They create amazing, amazing pieces. I swear you can even say it's like Italian jewelry. And I was rejected by him because he called my designs horrible. And I had also some stones and some diamonds that I was very proud of. And he's like, what is this? This is horrible. This is all horrible. I was like, so you don't want to create for me? He's like, no, I don't want to create anything for you. I was like, okay. I went home, I didn't sleep. So I'm the kind that if somebody rejects me, I work 10 times harder to reach more than I even where I wanted to be. So I went home, I stayed up all night, up to the morning, I created a whole collection because I was angry, because I was passionate, because I was rejected. And I did not let him, I don't care who he is or, or anyone that has been in this industry for 20 or 30 years to come and dictate my creativity. And I was so furious, but something came out of it. You know, negative comments or negative, um, people who are negative with you or, or, or who just make fun of you or whatever. This should give you, fuel you. It should not bring you down. You should accept it and laugh. And I mean, any, how do they say this? Like uh, any news is good news. So even bad news. So if people are talking about you or talking about your work that it's horrible or whatever, it's news. I mean, it is what it is. So it doesn't matter what they say about you. You shouldn't, when you enter this industry, you should not, you should close your ears and close your eyes and just do you. That's it. Uh, it is, it is what... uh, I have a question. Uh, you yeah. said your favorite collection is with freedom, right? So freedom doesn't have a shape or form. It's just a concept. So how do you represent it? You can, I'm going to tell you, I represented freedom for me. You can, it's not cliche, but I used feathers. Okay, let's okay. say it's cliche. I don't mind, okay? <laughs> I used feathers. You can use leaves. You can use rose petals to, to uh, you can use, I don't know, anything. You can use uh, anything to represent freedom other than wings or, or the, the usual, but it's how you overlap. So for my collection, I created feathers and then feathers on top of feathers. So when the pieces came on top of each other or the rings or the bracelets, they locked into each other. So they created the wings of a parrot. And that for me was freedom for me. But for you, freedom, you can create, the sun might be freedom for you. You know, the rain might be, any, any motif you can think of. And start small because I made a lot of mistakes with large collections. So I would create a collection that's 20 pieces and then I'd look at it and I don't like it anymore. <laughs> I can't do anything. So it's okay to make mistakes. And there are so many times where I created necklaces and then I turned them into earrings and then I turned them into bracelets. Don't be scared to um, experiment. Yes, it is gold. Ideally, how many uh, pieces go into a collection? Like how many count? Like you, as you said, you made 20, right? Like would you suggest? Yeah, like I usually. Know, 
suggest, I don't suggest, I suggest when you start, you start with, um, look, there's a very nice trick that now they're doing, which was not when I started. So let's say you create a ring. Okay, this is a ring, it's rose gold. Create one, because when you're gonna market this, when you go to your graphic designer or you picture it into white background. So the first thing that you need to do, you have three steps. You create your piece, you shoot it white background because you need it on your website. You need it to implement it into graphics. And you need the third thing, which is a model shot. If you don't want to create uh, shots with a model, that's fine. You can take that piece with the white background and you can just overlay it, any picture, a sunset, a leaf, whatever you want. Um, when you do shoot it white background, so what they're able to do is take that rose gold ring and create a white gold from it and a yellow gold. So that cuts costs for you. So you can create a collection of earrings, ring and a bracelet, just do one, one, one. And with the technology that we have now to show the consumer, you can create 20 pieces out of this. You can create red gold. You know, there's red gold and green gold as well. So maybe this is something somebody's into. I heard that in India, there's a lot of many colors of gold. So you can do that out of one piece. So just experiment with yourself. Maybe this, these three pieces that you create don't work. Fine, create another collection. In two, three years, you will understand your taste. I'm telling you, it's okay to make mistakes. I created two pieces that were so horrible and I thought they would never sell and they sold because although they're not my taste, they were someone else's taste. But always work with good quality. Don't, don't skimp on your quality. Don't hire a cheap craftsman that does cheap work just because you're gonna pay $100 less. I, I, I don't recommend that. I recommend you skip the diamonds and do something gold that is beautiful if you don't want to overpay. Uh, I also, also urge you that unless this is your brand image, because there's also this very famous brand, I can't seem to remember the name, where she works with only I3 diamonds and she has beautiful stuff, but this is her niche, I3 diamonds. And if you look around the market, there, is, there isn't uh, other brands that have I3 and I2 diamonds, which are the horrible diamonds, the very included diamonds. Um, there's another brand that only works with brown and champagne diamonds, and there's nothing wrong with that. They're beautiful diamonds. For example, for me, I went with the VS diamonds. Some, you market yourself the way, there are some brands that work only with black diamonds, and that's fine. And they do it in such a beautiful way. And you can use everything, but I mean, it's not bad. It's not bad if you want to if you want to start out, but you have to be honest with your consumer. If you want customers to last, your cust I believe your customer is your friend, especially for a woman. I'm, I'm not being uh, sexist at all, but because us women, uh, we befriend our cu uh, customers all the time because we're very uh, social, <laughs> a little bit more than uh, the male gender. So your customer is your friend. Don't cheat your customer ever be honest if you use uh, uh, si1 diamonds mixed with vs2 don't say this is vs and sell them si's this will ruin your name it will tarnish you nobody will trust you anymore remember as i said it's word of mouth good quality good reputation this is what you should work this is somebody asked me about branding this is your branding your reputation is your branding your item will speak for itself I'm not very into technology. I might be pitching you the wrong thing. Like I'm so anti-technology. I like the old school uh, type of word of mouth kind of thing. But of course, marketing is very important if you have the means for it and if this is something that's important to you. Is there anything else you want to ask me? I don't know if I can you guys. Are you guys talking to me? Yes. Should we please 
so there are various uh, cultures and religion in one country. Uh, what kind of culture and religion would you prefer to learn? I'm sorry, I didn't get that. I think if you can type it for me, that would be great because there's a lot of echoing. It's okay, take your time. You guys, I can't hear you. Oh, you're muted. Okay, that's fine. Okay. If there are any various religion and culture in the same country, which religion market would you prefer to target? You can target both. You can absolutely target both. So if there are various religions, like in India or where I come from, I'm Syrian. We have so many religions in our country. We have uh, Muslim, we have Christian, we have other various religions. I don't think that you guys are affiliated with, like they're not very, they're not a, a huge sect. And everybody has their own motive and own symbol, which is great. It's fine. You can be you can you can be a jeweler that is Christian and create jewelry for Muslims, and that's fine. I can create for Buddhists. I can create a cross for my my consumer. And plus, you can also always always you can do bespoke jewelry. I really highly recommend that you you create bespoke jewelry, which is jewelry made per customer or per consumer or what they like. Yeah, don't, there's no right and wrong. You can also create a line that is religious, a line that is flora, which is, as I said, uh, nature, a line that is fauna. But organize yourself. If you want to create a fingerprint in this industry, don't, unless you have a very, very big factory or there are these very big names, very big shops that have everything. They don't follow like lines. That's something else. They create mass productions. That's something else. But if you want to be a designer to be known within your name, uh, don't, don't mix so much. Start slowly. Start with a the collection, then go with a then you'll have different lines. You'll have maybe, maybe you'll have a line for every day and a line that's more high end. And then you can have a line that's all diamonds. Yeah? Yes. Um, hi. Hi. Um, I just wanted to understand. See, I'm an architect by profession. So have you collaborated with any other designer from any different profession to create a collection? Like suppose you have collaborated with a fashion designer or if you're collaborated with an architect or a graphic designer for a different set of collection. Have you Actually, done that? No, I have not, but I collaborated with two of my very good friends, they're artists, and I, and I was so inspired by their art that I created an enamel collection and I used their art to shoot my collection. But as an architect, this is amazing because I don't know if you, of course, you know Zaha Hadid. Uh, she passed away, yes. she's an architect. Yes. Okay. Yes. okay, actually I'm wearing the ring right now so I can explain to you. So this okay. ring, B0 okay. for Bulgari, she okay. created a line for them. So this is Zaha Hadid, where oh, okay. they used her, her lines to create okay. this collection 
versus this collection, which was the normal one. Okay, okay. So they, they, you see, they had this line for so long. They had this line for over like 15 years. And okay. then to re revive it or to continue it, they collaborated with another artist and see the difference with yes. these lines. So it's so nice. It's amazing that you're an architect. You can use your knowledge to, to your designs, I'm sure, are going to be beautiful because, of course, you're also very aware with the size ratio, which I yes. wasn't when I started because it was not my profession to understand um, how to be an architect or what. The, I was a business major. Like, I had nothing to do with even holding a sketching pencil. Okay. Best Thank of you. luck. You're most welcome. You guys, if you need me to go into details uh, about jewelry design, like go through the slides, I can do that for you, just for you guys to have a recap. Would you like that? Uh, yes, please. Yeah, yes. you would like that? Okay, that's great. So it's gonna be, so if anyone wants to ask me something, just stop me, I can answer, okay? All right. If I talk too much also, <laughs> let me know. <laughs> Okay, so as, as I said, you guys took the motive, yes? So I'm gonna tell you the steps about how to create a motive and then we'll move forward. So, okay. I don't know what happened. Okay, so take a motive that appeals to you or come up with a random shape or line. Sketch to two to three uh, elements of this motive. You're gonna need your need, your vellum, your black paper and um, a 90 degree line. So half of your earring or half of your bracelet can be equal to the other half. The, the 90 degree line is very important. I'm sure this is what you're learning in class right now. Okay, so principles of design. So principles of design are used to combine seven elements. Did you guys go through the seven elements of design? No? Yeah? No, you can type. Yes, we did. Every yellow only. You did, yes? Okay, so yes. first you have four main principles, which are the proportions, the balance, the rhythm, and the unity. And then you have to plan. You plan the basic shape, which is you want it to be in a square form, in a triangle form, in a circle form. And you scale of forms in a design, the ratio size. So guys, don't forget the ratio is very important. Sometimes you can design something so large, okay? And finish it, sketch it, color it, do what you want, but then you can Xerox it to the size that you actually want to implement. Keep in mind that gold is not cheap. So when you go big, you're going for very expensive craftsmanship, more diamonds, more gemstones. So you have to keep these in mind. Sometimes when we sketch, we really miss, miss this. All right. You have to see the division of space with the design. So also, sometimes you have a design that has filigree. Filigree is the the empty spaces inside the design. You also have to keep in mind the ratio between the empty spaces and the gold. Is this feasible? If I create these earrings with filigree, would they crack? Would, would it break because of the super empty space? So you also have to keep in mind the ratio between the empty space and the gold. I'm trying to go through them very fast. Of course, you have the axial balance, approximal symmetry, radical balance, and the occult balance. I'm sure you guys are gonna take this uh, in your class. And then you have the rhythm. So rhythm is also very important. Harmony is very important. There are many designers who create pieces that are not harmonious. I'm sorry, is anyone saying something? Sorry. Uh, are you talking to me or to each other? Uh, no, no, you can carry on. Okay, all right. Okay, keep in mind, sometimes you create jewelry 
that has repetition, okay? So you might create a necklace or a bracelet that is large, small, large, small, large, small. Sometimes you can go from large to small or from small to big. And sometimes you can create something not harmonious at all, which is okay. You can create, for example, a circle with a small triangle and then a large triangle with a small circle for earrings. And that's fine if this is what you want to do. There is no right and wrong, but at least understand what you're doing, that everything at least has to be harmonious. There should be unity. So how harmonious is your design according to the shape, size and balance and empty space? How your design is in its final look. Sometimes you might create something so beautiful, but you feel something is off. Follow your gut, repeat it again. It's okay to re-sketch the final design up to 10 times. That's perfectly fine. And plus when it goes onto CAD or it goes onto the computer or uh, if you transform it into uh, uh, this program that turns it into wax, sometimes you might look at it and say, uh, no, this is not what I want and this is too large or it's too small. Then you can repeat all those steps all over again, which is fine. There is no wrong. Then if you want to create also jewelry, uh, aside from the proportion, you have to think about the texture. Do you want it to be, do you want it to have embossing, debossing, hammered look, engraved look, uh, wavy look. So this is matte, shiny. You have the, the, the variations are endless. It's what you want to do. As I told you, sometimes they, they take the, um, the leaf and they, they create, they take the, the, the print of the leaf. Sometimes you might take a print of a special paper if you like the, the way it is. And then of course you have gemstones. After you, after you understand the size of your piece, you understand the finishing of gold, the finishing, uh, do you want it shiny? Do you want it mad? Do you want it wavy? Do you want it hammered? You decide what you want. You create your piece. Then you decide, would you like to add gemstones or diamonds to it? Yes or no. You might create the same collection, have diamonds in one and plain in the other. That's perfectly fine. So you have types of gemstones. You have to understand the sizes of your gemstones. So you have stars up to large solitaires or large carrots. I'm sure you guys are aware of that. You have the round brilliant cut. You have the beads or the drops. Sometimes we forget about beads and drops because they're not very used. Uh, beads are not that common in the Middle East, although they're so beautiful. But unfortunately with beads, you lose the you lose the value of the stone when you drill it. So you need to keep that in mind. And then you have the briolet. The briolet also, the ones that look like drop shapes, also get drilled. So also you have to keep in mind if you want to ruin that or not. That's why I think most jewelers prefer the setting with the prong because in the future, you can always just remove it and remake it. Whereas when you drill it, I mean, it's, it's, it will only always be drilled. And then you have the beads, as we said, then we have settings. The setting of your jewelry is very important. So setting is what holds the gemstone or the jewelry. If your setting is not of good quality, it is, it's not a good piece. Because the moment you sell your item to your consumer, if the gem falls off or the diamond falls off, this automatically will tarnish your name and it will tarnish your work and your quality. So be mindful of the setting that you use per piece. You can use high profile, low profile, uh, especially for solitaires and so on. You can use four prongs, three prongs. I mean, for solitaire earrings, three prongs are beautiful, but are they safe? No, I always advise my clients to go for the six prongs. And then last but not least, you have to think about the links and the joints. Uh, how are you going to link your bracelet? How are you going to clasp? What's the, what type of clasp are you going to be using? All of these are very small details, but they actually create the piece and they actually give quality to the piece. I mean, I prefer a lobster clasp to a round clasp. I think it's just more rich. And then you have the earring clasps and type of earrings. Also, you have to be mindful that not all your consumers have pierced ears. 
So you have to either create a piece where that it can be worn with pierced ears or without, or you have to know your demographic or the area. There are some many cultures that don't pierce their ears. So there's no point of doing jewelry with, with a post. Of course, you have types of metal and types of gold. You have white gold, yellow gold, rose gold, green gold, red gold. You have platinum, which is very soft. You can work with titanium. You can work with aluminum. Although you're taking this class, you don't have to limit yourself to gold uh, jewelry. You can use any type of metal, titanium, anything that you like. Would you like guys to ask me anything else? Because other than that, we're gonna be, I'll be diving into gemstones. So is there any pieces very brief? I apologize, like this is super brief. I'm so sorry, I really did not get that. I'm sorry, I keep making you repeat questions, but I really can't hear. Have you ever felt that, that your designs may get outdated in the future or something? Um, I mean, it's, it's an era thing. You can't say outdated less than 10 years. Yes, of course, in 10 years, probably my jewelry will be outdated. Probably in 10 years, for example, 10 years ago, yellow gold was not in at all. Like it was just white gold. 15 years ago, white gold, nobody. I'm speaking about Middle East. I'm not speaking about India. Uh, white gold was so in, yellow gold was very like uh, bougie, you know, like it, it just wasn't like in. Um, and now yellow gold is in fashion. Everybody that had white gold is giving me their items to dip them in rhodium to turn them into yellow gold because now yellow gold is in fashion. Chains are in fashion. Back in the day, I remember when I was young, my mom used to have those thick chains uh, growing up, I used to look at her and look at them in her old pictures. I was like, how could you have ever worn this? It's so vulgar, you know, like those large chains. How can you wear this? She's like, at the time it was in fashion. Now there's so much in fashion. Everybody that had their old large chains are wearing them and they're so in. So yes, jewelry does um, get outdated and updated, but you have classic jewelry that contains gemstones, that contains diamonds, that last forever. They're not outdated. Have you ever seen a solitaire that's outdated? No, oh, that's all. Right. I mean, even with other cuts, even with old mine cuts, they can never be outdated. They're, it's a solitaire, classical jewelry. So I also urge you and advise you, if you do go into this industry, to create a line that is classic because that would last. At least you know that this is going to be forever. Classic jewelry, unless you want to go for the funky jewelry. And what's your uh, biggest fear in this industry? Sorry? What's your biggest fear in this industry? Like, oh, Fear. my biggest fear oh this is a very big question sometimes i want to quit <laughs> sometimes i was like you know what i've had enough i don't want to do this anymore i mean you get these you get these feelings where you feel sometimes it's like the hamster running in the wheel like sometimes you're running and running and running and nothing is happening you're not getting anywhere but suddenly all your your work suddenly shows but you have to be patient. So there are many fears. I fear that I'm not doing enough. I fear that um, I'm not e able to articulate the stories I want to tell within my jewelry. I, I fear that the collection that I think means this will be portrayed as something else to someone else. Um, don't fear. I mean, everybody fears. We all have insecurities, but I mean, you do you, as I told you, try your best. And I'm telling you, like, everybody wants to quit. I wanted to quit so many times. Like, what am, sometimes I'd be like, what am I doing? Like, why am I, why am I, why am I putting myself into the stress? I swear, maybe you guys, you did not open your own company yet, or you're, or maybe you're working with your father or your mother. When you have your own thing, 
it's so much different than the dream. I mean, it's it's stressful, it's hectic, you have payments. It's not, it's not just you're sketching and creating and selling. There's a lot of things that come within this. So you have to keep in mind, research, read. As I told you, read, buy, buy biographies about other designers. It will really help you. Surround yourself with people like you. If you want to succeed, they used to always say like, don't come close to other other i mean if you sell shoes they say okay stay away from people who sell shoes like you no this is the biggest mistake if you want to succeed you surround pe- you surround yourself with people within your industry you have to because you know what's going on you know what's happening you're in the mix um you know if you're doing well or if you're not and they push you If somebody's better than you or more successful than you, they push you to better yourself. If you surround yourself within four walls and, but mind you not, you have to do you. So yes, surround yourself with your peers and your colleagues and support them and they can support you. And even if you didn't get support, surround yourself with people like you because that pushes you to move forward. Uh, Ma'am, is there an opportunity in as a jewelry designer in dubai of course of course dubai is the best country to come and open any business any business because honestly this this company well this company this country welcomes anyone with any industry and especially the gold and diamond industry here is amazing and you have so many people to learn from i learned from it's sad i was i was talking about this the other day I am, okay, my work, my pieces are not, um, are not, not just from me. My craftsman has a very, very big role in my items. We have to appreciate the people around us, the craftsmen, the people who guide you. Sometimes I go to my craftsman, I was like, I want to create this piece. And he would look at me like, no, you can't create this piece because of this, this, this. So he guides me. It's okay if people guide you, especially when you're new. So yes, there is a large industry here and there is room for many, many more. Uh, I have a question. Yes. Uh, there are musicians wearing uh, jewelries. So, uh, uh, Musician, football players. Yeah, football players, like uh, all those uh, people wearing jewelry. So if you ever get to design something for them, what kind of jewelry would you design for them? Like customize for them? See what they love. What do they love? I mean, um, for example, I don't want to specify races or genders or anything, but I mean, you see, you see where your artist is coming from. What does he or she like to wear? Do they like to wear the bulky diamond uh, necklaces? Do they like to wear uh, tennis bracelets, etc.? Always, if you want to dress celebrities, always go for the classics or go for your, your eccentric piece, you know, the piece that defines you. Let's say you create a collection of roses, large roses. So that's what you would want to gift, the large rose, because you want everybody to see your large rose, your, your main collection. But you can gift a, a, a celebrity anything that you want to gift, anything that's going to explain your brand and stand out. If you give them a small solitaire, that won't stand out because that's not your design. Sorry, are you guys talking to me? Uh, good afternoon. Uh, hi, nice to meet you. Uh, I am Alaya. Um, so, uh, hi. Uh, I was wondering when you started your brand, where did you? Uh, how did you start doing the marketing? Did you start contacting magazines, TV, um, just social media? How did you start to do that, to be known? Okay, so when I started, I didn't have much to begin with. And everything that I had, 
I, I injected into my uh, creating my pieces, creating my packaging, paying for my trade license. I mean, all of these things come in where these costs where you don't really think about. Uh, I was not able, for example, to open my own store. I, I was not able to be able to do that on my own. I had a lot of people approach me who wanted uh, to partner with me. I didn't accept that. I don't, I don't highly, highly don't advise any of you to do that. So when you're stuck financially, I don't advise you to partner with anyone. If you ever want to partner with anyone, it's when you're on your feet. It's when you're fully financially able to stand on your feet, not let anyone control you. This is one. Number two, um, when you want to start, when I when you want to start, and when you're you're when you start small, uh, it's okay to not be able to market the way that large companies market. So I started small. I started social media. I marketed on social media, on Facebook. Uh, slowly, slowly, two years later, I, uh, I had the opportunity to place my jewelry in a store where I rented the table. And uh, now I'm moving forward to something else. I left that store. I'm moving forward to, to entering another market. But I mean, you start small, which is okay. And social media is the best, best way to start at the beginning because you don't have to pay rent, you don't have to pay employees. And especially if your items are daily wear, a lot of people love now to purchase online. I mean, we got used to purchasing online after COVID. So this was a plus for our industry where, okay, I wanna gift someone. So I just purchase anything like a simple trinket online and I just move on. So build, build your, uh, build your website well, build your shipping well, if you want to be on social media, you have to make those strong. Yeah, yeah, thank you so much. Most and to, uh, well, so sorry for asking this, but just because I'm so curious. Yeah. If that, that's that, now you are, mashallah, you have a big name and you are already a brand. How do you plan? I'm not, I'm not a brand. I'm very humble. Don't me. I'm still new. Yeah, no, I <laughs> no, I have to say that. Um, mm -hmm. So uh, how do you plan to compete with big names? I don't want to. You compete. are already. You have your own path. Don't compete. Nobody can. So I want to ask you a question. Like, it's, sure. let me give you other samples. It's not compete. It's just to have your name between those names. Let's say it that way. Okay. It will come in time. And if you have good quality pieces, people will determine that. I can't say I'm a nice person. I can't tell you, you know what? Uh, my name is Tamara. I'm a very nice person, by the way. I can't say I'm a nice person. You have to judge me if I'm a nice person. So I can't judge my items. I can't tell you that, yeah, you know what? I'm gonna complete, compete with X name. I can't do that. If my items are uh, worthy, they will shine. Somebody sure. told me a saying once that whatever is beautiful can never hide. And I swear it stuck with me and it, answered so many of my questions because I all I always used to say am I ever gonna am, am I ever gonna people are are people ever gonna know me are my pieces ever gonna show how valuable they are in real versus the pictures on social media you doubt yourself everybody doubt. I sometimes doubt myself till now daily 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 and this is what keeps me pushing harder and wanting to do more and more I, I, I want to better myself. I look at myself last year and I say, what was I thinking? Like, what was I thinking of doing this ad? Or what was I thinking going on this interview or saying what I said on this interview or whatever? You Look, you are in no obligation to be the same person you were yesterday. Yeah. You can change you can keep changing, you can keep evolving. I am under no obligation to be the same person that you met last week. I don't owe you or anyone that, nor do I owe that to any of my consumers. I can change, I can do whatever I want. Artists can do whatever they want. Musicians, about artists, yeah. 
jewelers, designers, architects. I mean, an architect can create a very simple, sturdy building and then they can create something so whimsical. Yeah, but um, yeah, what I mean, yeah. uh, so sorry for the interruption. What I, I mean, you yeah. are a jewelry designer, but at the same time, you are a businesswoman. So yeah. you have to think, you have, you can't just think, uh, you can just have artistic brain without having this financial and this mm -hmm. grief to get yeah. into the business. Of so course. how do you make the balance and how, how, how or do you think about hiring someone who is um, a, an expert in management to do that for you? So you can be free and you will be relaxed and you will just think about creativity. I or is that I make you can. any distract? Does that make oh you distracted? Yeah, I can't. I can never hire someone to manage my my me to manage what no, I the, want. The, your business as financially. Yes, I yeah, I can't. I do have an accountant. Yes, I say it to all of you. Hire an accountant before you start because the amount of money you're gonna pay left and right, not on your yeah. item, they're yeah. gonna be crazy. And you have to keep into, it's not about crazy. I mean, you're not going to know where your money is going. You'd say, where did I spend this? Or what did I hire an accountant? Hire an yeah. accountant instantly before you start. This Thank is the best so advice I can give you. But if you want to create a name, do not yes. hire anyone to manage your brand. Not now, not when you're big, not in five years. You can hire a manager of a store but you have to be on top of your work at all times. And it's stressful, and this is what's stressful, but you told me as a businesswoman, you have to yeah. always mind the monetary, the monetary issue where you wanna make money. When I started this business, I did not start it to make money. And this is maybe, maybe this was very naive of me and maybe it was very, oh. but, but the money will come when people- Well, I am- uh, sorry for the interruption again. Well, uh, actually, I am already. I already studied business before, uh, okay. eighteen years ago. I, I am a very old woman, by the way, but I am a student now. Um, <laughs> oh, what? You can yeah. all, don't say you're an old woman. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yes, I am. It's okay. I am the oldest student here, and I because I think it wasn't naive of you because you have uh, you have a passion about being. Uh, Tamara Shamari, the designer. So that wasn't naive of you because you didn't think about money. Because I'll tell you something, what we learned, if you are thinking about making uh, a business to make money, it's never going to succeed. But when you make a business to make a name, to have a name, to be who you are and to show people who you are, that, will, that business will success because you don't have any worries. Exactly. So later you'll get, Yani. I'm sure into your Arab, right? There's a saying in Arab, what you, fought, what, you, what you seed, you grow. I don't know if that's right what I said. But I mean, what you do now will be fruitful in five years. Maybe not now, yeah. maybe next year, you know? So this is what I urge you to work on. And yes, finance, finances are very important and... There are so many times where I was not okay financially when I was doing my business, but I made it work. You know, you, you have to push through. I don't know how to say this in any other way. You're going to have down days and up days, and sometimes you're going to sell a lot, and sometimes you're not going to sell that much, and that's okay. It doesn't mean your jewelry is bad. It doesn't mean your jewelry is not nice. It's just you didn't find your right market. You didn't find your right your right demographic and you can start your jewelry let's say for 20 year olds 20 to 50 year olds and then you realize that uh no your demographic your demographics are teenagers and yeah, things things change you know what i mean or maybe maybe another nationality yeah yeah i understand you will learn. Oh, thank you so much. Well, happy to hear. Most welcome. Thank you so much. Most welcome. Yay.
And thanks for uh, all the information. You were so generous with all of that. Thank you so much. Thank I want to give so you guys as much as I can. Like, I want to help you. Like, if you have any okay. questions, please uh, and ask Thank me. Thank you so much. And I will be honored if we are able to contact you directly. Of course, that will of be course. anytime. You, can, you guys can follow me on Instagram on my personal and anything you need, you can just contact me. Thank you, thank you so much. Thank you so much, awesome. so nice.